Okay, I'll go ahead and get started. And if I if y'all have any questions I cannot answer, Bill Lambert will be answering them for me. Dr. Ash, sweet corn questions. Uh, and I'll take all the sweet corn questions. All right, we'll get started. Basically, what I'm going to talk about today is I've been going to this meeting for several years and listening to a lot of these high input growers like David Hula and Randy Dowdy talk and what they did with the tissue testing and what they did with the Randy Dowdy had a flag test and how we talked about emergence and getting them all up. So after we left this meeting last year, I got to listen to Randy Dowdy talk again. So he talked about this flag test. So I decided that I would do this flag test just to see because he always talks about the first ones up is always the most uniform. And if y'all heard Randy say, talk, he'll say, is this something you know or something you heard about? I mean, he says that often, you know, when he talks. So I said, well, this is all I've ever heard. You know, the first comes up, that's what we've heard about. So basically what we're going to talk about first is the tissue sample. Now, we have a real good pioneer rep. Kelly's in the audience right here. In the past, we well, Sanders now, but at the time, he was going around promoting, trying to take tissue samples for these guys and soil samples to get their yields up, okay? And me and Kelly talked about it, and basically, when he's doing that, it's just one spot in time right then, and everything else affects it. Weather can affect it. Cold soils can affect it. Just everything. And a lot of times, it might come back as deficient. So last year, we kind of come up, Kelly said he wanted to sample one grower and I got another grower to, to buy in on it. So that's what we did. So basically, we did five sites and I'm only going to talk about two of them. We started at V4 and went to R5, okay? And on the Randy Dowdy test, we had six locations. We're going to talk about three sites, three different soil types, three different varieties, and everything is adjacent rows, okay? All right, just to set this up, we, we take the samples, put them in the bags, write the growth stage down, and we send it to Waypoint. Uh, I think Oscar, they helped me on it. And Anyway, we'd get this, get it back, and it'd give us a range, expected range of the nutrients in the plants. Now, for the most part, they ran other nutrients, copper, boron, zinc, and all, all of them were fine. This last year, in our particular area, we had a hard season going into plant. We planted the 1st of March, and we got to do it the end of March, 1st of March, April, okay? So, with that being said, all the soils are cold, wet. In addition to that, these two sites I'm showing you here were along the Mississippi River. Now, for most of y'all, the river has been up for two years. So things that were generally dry were wet come this year. So what we started doing, we started around V4. And you can see in yellow, that's when we kind of noticed that, that the, the area right there in red, that's when the sufficiency range has dropped out on the phosphorus. All right? So this particular grower had his dry fertilizer out in the fall. He came back, he planted, he put his uh, starter out. So they decided at that point in time, they would put out some more phosphate and they used drop nozzles. So they, they had gotten set up to do that, so they did that. So about two and a half weeks later, after they got it out, you can see the sufficiency range on the phosphorus came right back in line. Now, in this other test, it did exactly the same thing, about two weeks and it was, you know, because of the wet soil. The other test, that I'm not showing y'all. Basically, the soil types are a little bit heavier. They didn't stay out about a week and they popped right back in with a sufficient range because it warmed up, the corn went to growing, everything was back in line. Same thing here. Except this grower, he's all liquid. So when he side dressed, his corn picked it up. Okay? So the, I guess the takeaway from this right here is this. Doing the season-long tissue sampling validates your fertilizer program. It, it either tell you how well you're doing or how bad you're doing. And if you want to get to the next level, that will tell you. 
All right. The other part, this is the Randy Dowdy flag test. Now, basically, we'll, you, when I show you all this, the f first flags we put down are the blue ones. The next one, the decks emerge is yellow, orange, pink, and red. This basically looks like we measured out one, one thousandth of a row. We started putting the flags down as they come up. This is another one. This shows we're starting to fill in the flags. And y'all can see the blue flag right there next to that corn plant is a little bit older than the other. All right, this is just another shot of another one. And then you can see the flag colors, how they emerged. And this is just another shot. That's all four colors in one spot. They just emerge slower. And this is in some wet, cool sand along the river. One thing we did, because I would had this happen before, we uh, flagged these pretty good and had a GPS with us so we could flag them because sometime during the year we're going to lose the flags, the farmer's going to run over them, our hand's going to take them down or whatever. You know? And even like, even like this, this was at the end of the field. I knew that flagpole was when we put that flag down. When we got there in July to take those samples, we walked around them flags so we couldn't find them for 10 minutes. So it, we took pictures, GPS. So it's just good to reference this. Okay? They're hard to find later in the year. This just shows you, you see the blue and the yellow, and the red is just a little bit smaller. What's the, what's the time separation? Probably every two days. Yeah, about two days. Now, Randy Dowdy wants you to go by there every day. I didn't have that kind of time. I went by there every other day and tried to do it. So over a period of a week, we got them all filled in, okay? That just goes, we just flagged that so we'd know how to go back down the road. And that's what it looks like when we started getting our samples. All those are flags beside the corns that we'd done earlier. Just ripped the ears back. And then what we did, whatever is one one thousandth of a row, we marked them, we counted every ear as one, two, three, four, five, six to the end. And every one of those flag colors, we wrote it down as we collected the data. Then we recorded the cob length, the number of long, uh, kernels down the cob, the number of rounds, and we weighed each cob on all these sites. So when you get out there, and I would encourage everybody to do this because it's pretty eye-opening because we, you know, I do it a lot, but I, you know, when I'm doing it, making counts, I'm not doing it for 13 foot or 14 foot a row. I'm just doing three or four and looking right there. But you'll notice on some of these, you know, you'll see a rolled up leaf that was a plant that was just barren. It didn't have nothing on it. This is just another shot. This is some of the heavier ground we did. This is probably the more uniform uh, of the test we had. This is one of the other ones that was on some of that cold, cold sand. And you can see, you know, we got missing uh, ears down there. That just, we just recorded that. And that just goes to show you, this is some of the data we just captured. I mean, it took some time to do this. It really did. It took us about three quarters of a day to go to all these sites and write all this down. And that didn't count going in there and uh, weighing all the cobs. That's just another shot. So what's it tell you when you get to the end of the day? And uh, I can't see that as well, but basically this is it. All right, what, what I ended up doing is three different sites. You see it's South Concordia, Center Concordia, and West Concordia. And it's row one and row two. Now every one of them flag colors is in there. Now what I did, I counted the number of plants by flag colors. So if you look at South Concordia one, it's got number of plants by colors 11. The next one's six, the next one's four, and the pink is eight, okay? So to, to do this statistically, I should have shelled a cob and weighed it and did all that. I, I mean, I didn't do all that, okay? I'm going to assume that if the cob 
weighed more, it had more kernels, and I'll assume they all had the same moisture. Because I wouldn't, I mean, I didn't have that kind of time. So basically, looking at that, I combined, I wanted to know how much better the blue was than the bottom tier. So if you combine the blue color and the yellow color and average those numbers, it came up with a certain cob weight. And if you average the yellow, the orange, and the pink, it came up with a different cob weight. So that right there told me that those were the first to merge that had to be heavier. Okay. So then I got to think, I said, well, like on the first example, how much better is the yellow and the blue over the orange and the pink? And basically, it was 26% better, kernel weight, okay? So I said, okay, that's, that's, that's good to know. All right, so then I said, well, how much of the yield? Now, I made an assumption. All this was good corn. It all cut 200 bushels. All these sites did great. So I'm going to assume that this corn is going to cut 200 bushels. So if I assume that, in using the orange color that came up later, and it made up 42% of the yield, if it would have come up all the same, I would have had a 22 bushel increase in yield. So if you crunch the numbers, and we'd all heard this, you know, the first that comes up, that's the most uniform, that's where you get all the, if you crunch the numbers, that's exactly how it worked out. So, you know, I would seen this, I'm sure, years ago, but this, when Randy Dowdy talked about it, and so did David Hula, I just decided we would do it and prove it to ourselves that it did work. So, and as you go down, you can see on this last one right here, this West Concordia, you know, the first emerge wasn't a whole lot better. It wasn't but one point versus six. You see? Did you say the soil temperature was cold, Steve? Yeah. Y'all didn't measure the temperature when you planted it? No, nah, I didn't do all that. You know, how can, that, can you attribute that to the, uh, the, each individual kernel of the variety of corn? I mean, does that mean each one's going to have the same vigor to come up through the They're soil? not all going to be you the same vigor because same we're, it's just like people. They're not all the same, but they're That's close, you know? <laughs> yeah. So you just have to assume some of that, you know? It's going to be a little bit of generic variation in it. But I guess you have to, like they do, Dowdy, I think he said he won't even plan it start until it's 56, 57 degrees soil temperature, you know, for the next four or five days. So that does give it an advantage to get a quicker stand. Cecil, no. when we rush too, I mean, sometimes if you have some planter issues, some of them's going to be planted a little bit deeper or shallower, so you're going to have some differences. Yeah. That's right. You're going to have some. And that, and that kind of goes back to show, you know, it, it, even at, on the bottom right here, you can see the first one, uh, that 40, is it 42% right there on the West Concordia Row 2? You know, if you look at that, it had more corn come up later than it did it initially. Now, that was just kind of strange, but that's how it worked out, you know, when we counted everything. Or well, if you plant too fast, you know you're going to have... You're going to have more bounce. It's not as uniform. But, you know, I would challenge everybody to try that. I mean, just go out there and put the flags down. Mark the row at the end of the year, and and it and it's going to tell you how you did your, your planter day. And another thing, if you do it, you know, you're, let's say you're going to plant thirty three thousand, okay, and you go out there and two weeks later, and you or you start doing this flag test, and you know you didn't end up with twenty eight thousand. But well, that tells you right there how efficient you was on your planter. You might have been going too fast, might have been too cold, might have been a lot of other things. Might have caught a two inch rain. I don't know, but you got to work it back. And then at the end of the season do what I'm telling you, then you, because the only thing you're going to get paid on is how many years you harvest. It ain't how many plants you planted. So when you back it back into it, then at the end of the year, if you write all this down, you, you kind of have an idea how you did. That's your scorecard at the end of the year. You know? So, but basically, that's it. And, um, you know, you have any questions? Where you went after you had to do all that handwork. Yeah, yeah. And have a few margaritas too. Yeah. This may be a loaded question, but what do you feel you got from doing this? Well, as a crop consultant, I finally proved it to myself that what these high yielding guys tell us all the time, being more uniform, da da da. I feel like we need, as consultants on, with farmers, 
to get them to slow down. I got still got some farmers plant seven, eight miles an hour. I mean, then I got some that plant four miles an hour, four and a half. They plant slow. They do a good job. And that, some of this data was there. Uh, actually, two of these sites were replanted. So we, we, when they replanted, that's when we got the data because the first one we lost. So we came back and did it again. The one I showed you that uh, didn't have but 1.3 bushels versus six, he replanted all that corn. And that's why I think, and he, if you looked on his ears, they were real pretty uniform. They wasn't a lot of variation. There wasn't a lot of misses in there. He, plant, he did a really, because the first time he planted, he was planting around six miles an hour, six and a half. The second time when he got to go lick that calf again, he did it at four and a half miles an hour. He did not want to do it again because he was out of seed. You know, they had a big seed. How much lag time was there between the three, three months? And how much time did the ground have to warm up? All right. Um, most of that was planted the end of March, 1st of April. So, yeah, it started warming up a good bit. But in them two sites with the cold sands like this, uh, South Concordia and Center Concordia, <coughs> Both of those, and I picked out some spots that wasn't necessarily going to be uniform. I, I'll be honest, I wanted to really see what was going to happen. So when I, these wet spots were out there in the sand, I wouldn't pick those spots out. And we picked out some good spots. But I knew the wet spots is the ones that are going to tell me more than the good spots. Were they all done with the same type of planner? No, they, no, they were, uh, no. No, some were center field. Some were hoppers, yeah, and then they were three different varieties. All, all of them were three different varieties and three different soil types. They're, I mean, and, and the data on all three, all six sites, bared out exactly the same. There was no, there was always a yield increase on the first emerge blue and yellow versus the orange, pink, and red. Always. Cecil, did he talk about? I've never been to one of their presentations but what kind of management decision changes he made depending on his data from the flag test I mean was what would he do I really different? can't get into that I mean he, he you know when What's you're sitting there listening to him he's talking so fast and you're just trying to absorb yeah. it I'm not gonna because uh, yeah, yeah. they're they're high input and they're right. doing the you know like he talked to David Hula and he was using them milk jugs and five gallon buckets with holes in them to try to get the yield. I mean, he was doing it all. Had time to ride his pivot, and I mean, I ain't got that kind of time, man. It's worth a thousand words. I mean, it just goes back to the importance of uniform emergence. Yeah. Cecil, to answer his question, what he what he said in, in, in uh, one of his discussions is he takes that flag test, and if he's if he's if he's got potential for 300 bushels. He treats right. that like 300 bushels if he's got potential for 500 That's bushels, right. You're asking, that's, like and that's what you're asking. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's you're right. Information to apply to the crops. That's right. That's right, Mr. Buddy. It absolutely does. Yeah. And, uh, One of the key issues here, I think, that you mentioned with reprieves with the replant is that jumping out there really fast when the ground is wet. Cold. Mm -hmm. When seed costs $150 an acre, if you wait two weeks, you might be a lot better off. You ain't got to go through all of this. Actually, one of the growers did that. He generally plants early, but for some reason this year he backed out and he waited. And he's the only one that didn't replant, and he was steady planting when he, after two weeks after we all figured out we was going to have to replant, he started planting, and he started, he'd plant maybe 100 acres of the rain, and he started getting all his up, you know. And that one field that, uh, that was cold and wet and shows the 22 bushel, that was one of his fields, and it was along some wet sand, the Mississippi River stayed up so long, you know, it was just wet. And, and that's field, that field right there, even when they plant cotton on it, the cotton will not grow until the end of June or 1st of July because it stays that wet. It's just sugar sand, you know, that's all it is. It just stays wet. So what did we learn? Yeah, we learned that we need to slow down, get a good uniform emergence. Uh, we, we need to do everything we can to get it up right the first time, <laughs> everything, including not putting a lot of salt in there on the seed. Uh, I like farmers. I mean, I just like them. Uh, not using... Heavy, I hate heavy duty cast iron wheels. I just hate them. I mean, with a passion, because it just seals off that ground so much. I like it kind of flaky when it comes up, it just pops right up. 
and, and I guess it goes back to when we all scouted cotton. We had cotton wheels. We did everything to get it up. You know, and I think the same applies to beans and corn. I really do. Any more questions? All right, I'll turn it over to Dan. By the way, he's going to be at Ravel February 21st. If anybody wants to come. Oh, is he? That's good. This will be there. Oh, yeah. 